Today, we gather as an online community, united by one voice, to worship and praise our Lord and Saviour. first time here at Highlands Presby, but I know several of you from other situations. Uh, Elijah was a student of mine when I was at the Harari Theological College, and some of you I know from other contexts, so it's lovely to be here with you today. I want to start with a series of questions before we get into 1 Samuel 1, and the questions are this. What do you do when you live in a day when everyone seems to be doing what's right in their own eyes? When the clergy uh, have been corrupted and they sort of just go through the motions of ministry, uh, when their philosophy of ministry seems to be what they can get from themselves instead of how to advance the work of the Lord. What do you do when you have a personal, pressing, even oppressive problem weighing you down? What do you do when you have a bitter rival who seems to live to provoke you when your crime seems to be simply existing next to them? What do you do when your home is not the haven that God intended? Those are real questions, aren't they? And uh, we fit all too well in our real world. And yet, those questions are not new to our generation. These are the exact questions that we find the situation of a certain family in, in the Bible, This family and their two-chapter story are part of a larger story. And um, it's a story of transition. A plan to transition from 300 years of judgment in the book of Judges to the fulfillment of God's promises for uh, a monarchy that God had made back in the book of Deuteronomy. Now... Sadly, this transition is not because God's people suddenly want a theocracy with God as their true king and a human king as his deputy leading according to the holy word of that high and holy king. No, this transition we're going to learn comes about because God's people were were tired of just being a loose confederation of tribes whose whose larger neighbors would, would pounce on them mercilessly and repeatedly. Now, in reality, the Bible tells us that their enemy's continual encroachment was only because God's people were in continual rebellion against God. And so God would would permit their foes to oppose, and it was only in the throes of judgment that, that Israel would finally cry out to the Lord for a season. And each time, God would respond by raising up a deliverer, a judge, to deliver his people. And just as soon as God's people were were rescued, the Israelites would sort of slide right back into the gutter. (laughs) And this whole sad cycle would repeat itself for about 332 years. And so eventually God's people demanded a king. And they did this not for God's esteem, but for their own esteem. They literally said, we want a king to be like the other nations around us. They want to be like everyone else. Uh, They wanted a king for the king's standing army, so the standing army could protect them instead of the arm of the Lord. And yet what what man meant for evil, God used for good. And God will capitulate to their self-centered request, and he will use it to transition Israel into a monarchy. God will... uh, give them their first king. And he will look quite good in the eyes of man. He will literally stand head and shoulders above all of his peers. But his inner character is a disaster. And so he will wilt under the weight of his God-given task, and God will have to strip the kingdom from he and his line. And then God will graciously raise up a new king, a man after God's own heart, And while this king may not look like much, he will accomplish much because his inner character glorifies his maker. 
And so God greatly blesses that king, and by extension, all of his subjects in his kingdom. Now, sadly, <laughs> that man is still a man. And while David may be the best king of Israel, even he ends in tragedy. Because the king God's people ultimately need, well, he's no mere man. And so this transition to monarchy just kind of serves to whet our appetites for a king who one day gets it right. And that king, well, that would be a king who seeks first God's kingdom and God's righteousness. And that king, well, he would be the king of kings, wouldn't he? But for now, things are much more forlorn as we, we open the scriptures to the first chapter of 1 Samuel. And we're going to see God's plan of transition. And as we survey this eternal plan to install the, the Son of Man, there is a smaller story that God wants us to know in how he achieved this eternal story. And that story is Hannah's story. And, and Hannah's story begets Samuel's story, which is integral to the Messiah's story. So would you turn with me in the Word of God to 1 Samuel 1. 1 Samuel 1. And what we're going to do today is we're going to learn how to be a person of grace in a difficult time and place. From 1 Samuel 1, we're going to see how to be a person of grace in a difficult time and place. And so as we turn in the word of the Lord, let's turn to the Lord of that word and ask him to bless our time together in his text. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we believe you when you tell us that the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword, that it contains everything we need uh, so that we would be thoroughly equipped for every good work you have for us. We believe that we don't live on bread alone, but every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we turn to the psalmist, we turn to that first good king, David, and we ask as he wrote in scripture that you would um, show us wonderful things in your law this morning. Awaken in us the power of this text, the relevance of this text, and may we be deeply impacted by at least one portion of what we share today. May each of us come away strengthened and encouraged, convicted, and, and edified. We pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Now, our sister just read the text. It's 28 verses, so you probably don't want me to do that again, right? <laughs> uh, and so I'm going to start with just verse 1, uh, because verse 1 is the Bible's description of Samuel's father. And if you're paying attention in Scripture, this is almost exactly a parallel to how the Bible describes Samson's father in Judges 13.2. So look for a second at verse 1, and you'll see this quite clearly. Uh, there was a certain man from Ramathiam, a Zuphite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroam, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuph, and he was an Ephraimite. That's almost identical to how Samson is described in Judges 13.2. You have uh, a certain man, it says of both people, uh, his uh, lineage and his geography, and then we're going to learn that both of them have barren wives. And why is this that the Bible almost perfectly parallels the saying of their stories? It's because the Bible wants us to remember that these two figures, Samson and, and Samuel, are contemporaneous figures in much of their ministry. Uh, you see, they're both fighters against the Philistines. They're both supposed to be Nazarites for life, but one of them breaks his vow to God. Uh, they're both judges over Israel, but one is helpful at best only militarily and really only temporarily because his God is his stomach and he yields to his own appetites. And so his judgeship ends in, in ignominy. Now the other judge is our judge today, Samuel, and Samuel's judgeship is primarily spiritual, and his ministry is much more helpful to God's people. So what can we learn from verse 1's introduction to this judge, Samuel? Well, we learn that his father is a certain man from Ramathiam, and that's often shortened in the Bible to just Rama, as you see it in verse 19 of our text today. And the word Rama means height. 
Now, Rama Theum Zophim, as the ESV or New American Standard render the Hebrew a bit more literally, that means the twin heights of the Zophites. And so we learn that Samuel was born in a city that is situated on two adjacent gomos in the hill country of Ephraim, which is north of Jerusalem. And you need to remember that ancient cities were almost always set on high elevation, so they had the defensive higher ground. So this makes sense, right? Okay. Now Samuel's father is a man named Elkanah. And Elkanah is introduced by a rather lengthy genealogy, which tells us that he must have been rather socially prominent. He was a, he was a somebody in his day. So he got a long list of who he came from because he's so important. And we also see that uh, he's pretty affluent because he's able to afford a number of bulls and sacrifice when his boy is born. He's able to afford two wives. That means he's both socially prominent and financially affluent. But you know, you can have money and you can have social standing and you can not necessarily be all that God intended for you to be. For you see, in 1 Chronicles 6, 33, 1 Chronicles 6, 33, the Bible tells us that this man Elkanah was a Levite. And he was specifically from the Kohathite clan of the Levites. And this is going to explain how later his son Samuel can serve at God's tabernacle. Because genealogically, Elkanah is a Levite, that is, he is a priest, which would mean his son Samuel can also serve in the priesthood. But if that's true genealogically, we also see that geographically, the Bible tells us that he is living in the land of Ephraim. Now that's fine, because we know from the Bible that the Levites, who didn't serve at the temple site, or back then the tabernacle, which was in Shiloh at the time, they were to live in the Levite cities that are mentioned in Numbers 35. And no Israelite, if you look at a map, was far more than about a half a day's journey from a Levite city. So God was saying, wherever you live, on the north and the south and the east and the west, even if you're far from the temple and the tabernacle, you can go to someone who knows the word of God and you can get biblical counsel. Well, that's great. Here's the problem. Elkanah is not living in a Levite city. Ramathian Zophim is not a Levite city. So here we have this man, and, and, and he's a Levite, but he's not apparently practicing as a priest. And, and he's not living in a Levite city. And so you have to begin to wonder about Elkanah's commitment to Scripture. <laughs> you see, he takes his family, the Bible says annually, it says it several times, he takes his family annually to Shiloh. But Jewish males, all Jewish males, and especially priests, they were supposed to go and take their family to three annual festivals. Deuteronomy 16 is clear that there were three annual mandatory festivals. There was Passover, there was Pentecost, and there was the Feast of Tabernacles. All right, so what? So why does all this matter? I'm glad you asked. We need to remember where we are in Scripture when we're in 1 Samuel 1. You see, Hannah and Elkanah lived during the time of the judges. Indeed, Samuel is going to be the last judge in all the Bible. And then kings are going to take over instead. So what is true about the time of the judges? And the book of Judges ends with a summary statement about that period. And here's what it says. It says, in those days, the days of the judges, the days Samuel was born into, there was no king in Israel, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. You see, Elkanah and Samuel's story and Hannah's story are, are set in a time when, when absolute truth has been abandoned, and, and your personal truth is what's been elevated and celebrated. And people basically do whatever suits them. And it seems like this man, Elkanah, is really no different, is he? In verse 2, it gets worse. <laughs> Elkanah had two wives. Now, God's plan for humanity is monogamy, but because we live in a fallen world, we find here polygamy. And uh, polygamy is regulated in the Old Testament, but it's never recommended. And every time we see polygamy in the Bible, we see a home full of strife and suffering. Every time. And so this brings us to point one today in our sermon. <laughs> 
how to be a person of grace in a difficult time and place. The first point today, how to be a person of grace in a difficult time and place, is this. People of grace are still called to live in a fallen world. People of grace are still called to live in a fallen world. So Elkanah had two wives. <laughs> one was called Hannah, and one was called Panina. And Hannah is listed first because she was the first wife, and the wife that he really loves, apparently, as you read the story. But, but tragically, this first wife, Hannah, is barren. And, and so since he's sufficiently affluent, he takes on a second wife to bear his heirs, and her name is Penina. Now, Hannah means grace. She's going to be our person of grace in the story, in case you were missing that. Hannah means grace. And the other woman, Penina, her name means ruby or pearl, depending on how you translate the Hebrew. Uh, but she's no gem, is she? <laughs> no. Uh, Hannah, our person of grace, what do we see? Well, we see the very first thing in the story is that people of grace are still called to live in a fallen world next to the Paninas who make life difficult. How fallen is the world? Well, that's point two today. Um, people of grace can still have challenges in their home. People of grace can still have challenges right in their own home. The Bible says in verse 2 that Elkanah had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Panina. And Panina had children, but Hannah had none. There's the conflict. It gets worse. Year after year, this man went up to the town to worship to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where the tabernacle was, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, the high priests, were. And whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife, Panina, and all of her sons and daughters. So you go to sacrifice the Lord, and each kid gets a portion, and his wife gets a portion. Now, if you have a whole bunch of kids, do you get more portions than somebody who has no kids? You get a lot more portions. So it becomes very visual, the barrenness and emptiness. This time of supposed family celebration. We're going to the temple. We're going to be together. This time when we're supposed... Maybe you have families like this. The time you come together, like Christmas and Mother's Day, is a time where it doesn't quite go the way the greeting cards say it should work. These people of grace still experience a broken world and, and, and still experience challenges at home. And, it, and it's worse. So when, when the day came for Elkanah to give his sacrifice, he gave portions of meat to his wife, Penina, and all his sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion. He's trying to, 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 to help her in this time because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. And because the Lord had closed her womb, her rival, the other wife, kept provoking her with a reason. What was the reason? In order to irritate her, okay? So the Bible says this wasn't accidental. It wasn't, look at all the food I have. You don't have any food. It's, ah! <laughs> right? She's really intentional. Poke, 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 poke to irritate. Now, I'm sure you don't have a person in your life who knows how to poke, poke, poke and irritate. But for your neighbor who does, this is a helpful scripture. Hannah was childless. And sadly, she was relentlessly, mercilessly, painfully tormented by her more fertile rival. And Hannah clearly demonstrates that a person of grace can still have troubles at home. So what do we do with the people who sort of emotionally choke us and live to provoke and poke us? And that brings us to point three today. Point three is this. People of grace turn the other cheek. Instead of adding fuel to the fire when dealing with the ungracious. People of grace turn the other cheek instead of adding fuel to the fire when dealing with the ungracious. You see, the Bible never tells us that Hannah ever tells Penina off. Hannah could have easily said, well, Elkanah loves me more. That would be true. Uh, but Penina, you are here because of expediency. I am here because of my excellencies. That would have been true. <laughs> but if uh, before there was ever a New Testament, Hannah followed the command of Christ, she turned the other cheek, didn't she? Before there was an Apostle Paul at all, she lived out the testimony, the ad admonition of Romans 12, 18, that says, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. 
Before there was the book of James, Hannah kept a tight rein on her tongue because it's a restless evil, isn't it? See, people of grace turn the other cheek instead of adding fuel to the fire in front of the ungracious. Now, I wish I could tell you that if you do everything right and you respond in a Christ-like way and you're gracious in the face of those that aren't gracious, it's all going to go away and get better. But you live in a broken world, don't you? And you know that's not how it always works. And so we see that you can do everything right and still find yourself sitting in a lot of strife. Which brings us to point five today. People of grace still have deep and deeply personal troubles. People of grace still have deep and deeply personal troubles. Look at verse 7, please. This went on year after year. Some of you are dealing with things, and it's not just on Thursday this guy was poking me. It was for the last 13 years this guy was poking me. See, this went on year after year, and whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, this time of celebration, her rival provoked her until she wept and could not eat. The feasts were great times of, of feasting. <laughs> you went to the, the feast, and you got to have all this food that many, most of the year you maybe just subsisted on your daily bread, and you had basic staples. But at the feast, you got this good stuff, because God's a good God. And he said, bring the good stuff, and then he gives you some of the stuff, because he's a good God. And here she is, supposed to be with family celebrating, and she's weeping. She's supposed to be eating, and she's not able to eat. Verse 9, once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, the family, Hannah stood up. And now Eli, the priest, he was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's temple. And in bitterness of soul, do you feel that? In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much. She wept profusely. And she prayed to the Lord. I want you to skip down to Hannah's response to Eli, the priest, in verse 15. Hannah replied, I am a woman who's deeply troubled. Friends, do you understand that people of grace can still have deep and deeply personal troubles? Great men of God have been troubled greatly in Scripture. At points in their ministries, Moses, Elijah, and Jonah all asked for God to kill them because they didn't want to keep going anymore. And Satan loves this. <laughs> Jesus told us Satan comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. And so on an emotional level, there's many ways he does that, but just emotionally, he, he loves to steal our peace, doesn't he? he? He loves to kill our hope, doesn't he? And he loves to destroy our joy. And Satan does this not only to make us miserable, we're supposed to have an abundant life in Christ, not only to make us miserable, but also so we can go from being attractive ambassadors for Jesus with a winsome witness who are a perfume in the room to becoming ineffective and unproductive because our testimonies are unpersuasive. Instead of you and I being full of joy and full of hope and full of grace, that's a perfume in the room, isn't it? We can become like our neighbor and sort of be like the stench in the trench. <laughs> And Satan wants that. He wants you miserable, and he wants you ineffective and unproductive as an ambassador for Jesus Christ. So, what is a person of grace to do in the face of deep and deeply personal troubles? That brings us to point five today. People of grace take their problems to the Lord. People of grace take their problems to the Lord. Why do they do that? Because Psalm 55, 22 is true, and you might want to write it down in the margin of your Bible. Psalm 55, 22 says, cast all your cares on the Lord, and he will sustain you. Because Isaiah 41, 10 is true. You might want to write that down. Isaiah 41.10. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And therefore, we ought to follow the counsel of 1 Peter 5.7. 1 Peter 5.7, you might want to write down. 1 Peter 5.7 says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Not just about your neighbor, not just about the pastor, not just about the church, not just about his work. Cast your anxieties on him because he cares for 
you personally. Now zero in on verse 10 again, please. In bitterness of soul, Hannah wept much and prayed to the Lord. Hannah was honest to God in prayer, just like the Apostle Paul was. He had a thorn in the flesh, and he was honest about it. He didn't say, oh, everything's fine, I'm great. You know, it's not spiritual to say you're warm and dry when you're cold and wet. But some saints have been poorly discipled and told to be, say just that, right? Paul said, ouch, I have a thorn in the flesh. God, would you take care of it? He prayed three times, and eventually God said, no, my grace is sufficient. But Hannah was honest to God in prayer, just like the Apostle Paul was. Hannah was honest to God in prayer, just like the Lord Jesus was. When, when Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed three times for this cup to pass. But he said, ultimately, not my will, but thy will be done. And in that case, it was God's will for the cup not to pass. And thank God that Jesus drank that cup, that you and I are able to be saved because of it. But what I want you to see is that it's okay to be honest with God in your prayers. He's omniscient. He knows everything. And he loves you, so he wants you to bring these things to him. Now, after being honest with God in prayer, she makes a vow. She asks for a child, and she vows to dedicate this child to the Lord, to be a lifelong Nazarite, which is a three-part vow. You, you don't cut your hair and, and you don't do two other things. And she only mentions one of the three things, but one part is meant to substitute for the whole. Verse 11. She made a vow saying, O Lord Almighty, if you will only look upon your servant's misery and remember me and not forget your servant, but give her a son. And then I will give to the Lord for all the days of his life and no razor will ever be used on his head. That's one third of the Nazarite vow. And she's using that to stand in for the entire vow. Do you notice this woman of grace? She asks God for a blessing. And it's a blessing she doesn't intend to keep for herself. Do you see that? She didn't intend to keep this blessing for herself. She intended for the blessing to be for the Lord. In many ways, my friends, it would have easier, been easier to go on being barren than to, than to have and then to hold and then to hand over your one and only son. That's what she's going to do. Perhaps God had given her an inner conviction that this child would, would have some part to play in the future of the nation and its redemption. I don't know. It seemed like Moses had that inkling. Uh, when Moses was, 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 was uh, you know, the basket baby and raised by Pharaoh's daughter in Pharaoh's household. And then one day he sees the, the Egyptian beating his fellow uh, Israelite. And so he murders that overseer. He takes the matter into his own hands. It seems like he knew he was going to be the deliverer, but he didn't know how. So he tried it his way. And how did that end? It ended with him having to flee. And 40 years of solitude in the desert. But more importantly, it was another 40 years before the emancipation of the nation. When we do things our way, even when God's told us to do it, when we do it our way instead of his way, we tend to make a hash of it. But Hannah's not like that. Hannah's a person of grace, and so she takes this to the Lord. Now, God can say no. He's God. We're not. But it never hurts to ask. In fact, Jesus invites us to ask, to seek, and to knock. James tells us many times, we as the church of the living God, we have not because we ask not. Not because we didn't try hard enough or have enough positive thinking, but because we didn't ask the Lord of the heavens, please may I have this. Sometimes he says yes. Now, verse 6 says, the Lord had closed her womb. So her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. Two things there. Number one, her barrenness is not an accident. It's part of the plan of God. Part of his plan in her life was this period of difficulty and pain. Number two, the rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. And there's an old-time scholar that, that uses this phrase that really hit me, and I hope it hits you. And, and he says that Hannah's predicament in verse 6, being provoked in order to irritate you, is what we have is, is a religious use of irritation. 
a religious use of irritation. You see, this daily provocation from the ungodly and the continual irritation that that provocation caused, that persecution caused, what did it do to Hannah? It drove Hannah to the Lord, didn't it? It was a religious use of irritation. So I began to think on that, and I wondered what daily annoyance might be reframed this week for Jesus so that every time we have that annoyance, and you know what it is for you, that it might drive you to the throne of grace. And then I began to wonder what the devil might do if every time he sent you that annoyance, it drove you closer to Jesus. And I began to wonder if I was the devil, <laughs> I might just slow down that irritation because it was sending that servant in the wrong direction from his intention. Just a thought. So let's go down to verse 12. As she kept praying to the Lord, she didn't just pray once, she kept praying. The high priest, Eli, observed her mouth. Her mouth was moving. No words were coming out. Hannah was praying in her heart. Now, in that time, people gave often public prayers aloud. And so he sees this woman whose lips are moving, but no sound is coming out. Her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. If you're young enough, that there's a uh, Megan Trainer song uh, about your lips moving. And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you're not young enough to know who Megan Trainer is. And her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. So Eli, given the condition of people who've been coming to the temple, instead of the worship of the living God, he's used to seeing all these people coming to the festival and they eat and they drink. When you eat and you drink, when you drink, sometimes you drink too much. And so his first thought isn't, here's this woman praying silently for this matter that's on her heart. No, he says, how long do you keep getting drunk? Get rid of your wine. Hurting Hannah is praying to God. And Eli, the priest, the clergy, having surveyed the sad state of so many tabernacle attendees at this particular festival, he wrongly thinks she's just another drunken reveler. Get out of here. And there's an, a commentator named Warren Wearsby, and he reminds us, friend, when you give your best to the Lord, it's not unusual to be criticized by the very people who ought to be encouraging you. When you give your best to the Lord, it's not unusual to be criticized by the very people who should be encouraging you. If there was anyone in the world who should have come alongside Hannah and her petition to God Almighty, it would be the high priest of God Almighty. And yet he gets it wrong, and wrongly, to send some condemnation her way. So the question, <laughs> is that new in Scripture? Is this some kind of like weird occasional thing. Well, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, Moses was following God, and he was criticized by his brothers and his sister in Numbers 12. It, it, David was criticized by his own wife in 2 Samuel 6 for honoring the Lord. Uh, Mary of Bethany is immediately criticized by one of the 12 in John 12. And yet, you know what? God commends all three. You can be doing what's right, and some of God's people can tell you you're wrong. So how do you respond when you've been wronged by others, perhaps even spiritual leaders who ought to know better? Well, a person of grace responds with, what do you think I'm going to say? A person of grace responds with grace. It's just what she does. Verse 15, not so, my Lord. She uses a term of, of reverence for the high priest. Hannah replied, I'm a woman who's deeply troubled. I've not been drinking wine or beer. I've been pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant. Again, she puts herself in humility and puts him in a higher position. For a wicked woman, for I've been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Now, now when you and I uh, have been beat down by that irritation that doesn't seem to go away, it's very easy to begin to think like Elijah in the Bible and believe we're kind of all alone in our pain and, and no one else understands what we're going through. But you need to remember that Hannah is not the first barren woman in Scripture. Um, Sarah faced this in Genesis, and so did Rebecca. Manoah's wife was also barren until God raised up the judge Samson. Old childless Elizabeth in the New Testament gives birth to John the Baptist who prepares the way for the Lord Jesus. Did you know that some of God's best work comes when nothing else seems to be working? Some of God's best work comes when nothing else 
seems to be working. And I find it striking and, and, and mighty encouraging that God seems to go out of his way to use barren women as his preferred instrument in raising up key figures in human redemption. Whether it's laughable, like Isaac, whose name means laughter. Ha, I'll never get pregnant. You know how old I am? <laughs> she named the kid laughter, Isaac. Or whether it's impossible, like a virgin must conceive for humanity to be redeemed. Hannah shares in this fellowship of barrenness, but God has a way of using our weakness to display his great strength, doesn't he? So I want you to remember that when you're without hope, when you're without resources, when you're without strength, because that's a really, really good time to, to call on the one who has limitless resources, who has unlimited strength, and whose name, he says in scripture, is the God of hope. Which brings us to point six. Point six in this. People of grace take God at his word. And that changes their perspective, even if it doesn't always change their situation. People of grace take God at his word, and that changes their perspective, even if it doesn't always change their situation. Look at verse 18. She said, may your servant find favor in your eyes. So, so the high priest has just blessed her. And she went away, and she ate something. She had been fasting, and now she's feasting. And her face was no longer downcast. She had been weeping from the bitterness of her soul. But just on the word of the priest, her whole perspective changes. Now, I want you to notice, Hannah took it to the Lord, and the high priest himself blessed her, and her situation has yet to change. She goes away eating and happy, and yet she's not pregnant yet. She's going to get pregnant later. And she might not have ever gotten pregnant. I want you to notice her situation didn't change. But her perspective did. You might want to write Philippians 4.6 next to verse 18. Philippians 4.6. Because the Bible says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And he's always going to make it better. That's not what it says. It says, And the peace of God, here it is, which transcends understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The, the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but understanding usually is what I understand. And so if, if my problem evaporates, I understand. But sometimes God doesn't calm the storm. He calms my heart and keeps me in the storm. That ever happened to you? In Hannah's case, there was a baby in her future. That was God's plan for her and her people. Verse 19, early the next morning they arose and worshiped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. And Elkanah lay with his wife, Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. And she ultimately has a baby. So what do we do when God steps in and, and he steps up for us? And that's point seven today. People of grace keep their word. People of grace keep their word. Look at verse 20. And so in the course of time, Hannah conceived and gave birth to a son. And she named him Samuel, saying, Because I asked the Lord for him. And when the man Elkanah went up with all of his family to offer the annual sacrifice to the Lord and fulfill his vow, Hannah did not go. She said to her husband, after the boy is weaned, I will take him and present him before the Lord, and he will live there always. And Elkanah has to confirm the oath. It says in the Bible that the husband had to approve these oaths, and so he does. He says, do what seems best to you, Elkanah, her husband, told her. But he knew the temptation. The temptation would be the longer you're with the child, the harder it's going to be to part with the child. And so he says this, stay here until you've weaned him. Only may the Lord make good his word. Don't go back on this, Hannah. You made a vow. So the woman stayed at home, and she nursed her son until she had weaned him. Now, in biblical times, people had a lot more death among infants, and they often weaned children up until the age of three. We don't know how old Samuel was when he was presented at the temple, but it was after the first annual festival. It was sometime later. But Sam Samuel was taken to the temple because Hannah kept her word. And she handed her one and only son over to the work of the Lord. 
And that brings us to our final point today. If you were hoping this wasn't a pointless sermon, it's point eight. Point eight today. People of grace are willing to put what they love at risk to advance the work of the Lord in their generation. I'm going to say that again. People of grace are willing to put what they love at risk to advance the work of the Lord in their generation. Look at verse 25, please. When they had slaughtered the bull, they brought the boy, Samuel, her only son, to Eli, the high priest. And she said to Eli, As surely as you live, my Lord, I am the woman who stood here beside you praying to the Lord. And I prayed for this child, and the Lord granted me what I asked of him. And so now I give him to the Lord. For his whole life he will be given to the Lord. And he worshiped the Lord there. Now, the he is unclear in the Hebrew. It may be that Samuel, the baby, two or three, first worships the Lord at the temple there. Or it may be that this great act of sacrifice of the one and only son moved the high priest to worship. I don't know. The Bible's deliberately ambiguous on this. But what I do know is when you do things for Jesus, it moves people to worship Jesus. That part's clear. Now, I think you need to remember <laughs> what this woman is doing. So it's noble. She's bringing her one and only son to worship the Lord. But the priesthood is a mess. It's corrupted at this time. Eli is not much of a parent. And that's really apparent when you see how the Bible describes his two biological sons. He has two sons. They both have foreign names. One means tadpole in Egyptian. And the other one uh, uh, means Nubian. Eli's sons are Hophni and Phinehas. And the Bible says Eli's sons are wicked men. I thought they were in ministry. Yes, you can be wicked and be in ministry. Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. They just used their holy position as clergy to line their pockets with no regard for God, God's people, or God's glory. And so God is going to judge them severely eventually. In the next chapter, they're going to be snuffed out. They get away with it for a long time, growing fat on God's people. But they don't get away with it forever. So here is Hannah. She's our person of grace. And she has to muster the faith to place her one and only son in harm's way. Friends, people of grace are willing to put what they love at risk to advance the work of the Lord in their generation. Are you willing to send your one and only son into real risk to advance the work of the Lord? I'm so thankful that our Heavenly Father was. I'm eternally grateful that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. That whoever believes on him shall not perish but have eternal life. Friends, if we're going to see the gospel advance in our day, in Harare, and to the Tonga, and to our neighbor, and to Mozambique, where they're shooting up over oil, we're going to have to put some things at risk. The Bible calls that a sacrifice. David says, I won't offer a sacrifice that costs me nothing. We will be having to be willing to put things we love, people we love, at risk. To see the work of the Lord extended in our generation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, as the worship team comes up to lead us in song in just a moment, we come to you now and there's been these eight truths that people of grace must embrace. We must remember that we live in a broken world and until you send us to heaven, for now, we're here in the midst of all this brokenness, so with the comfort we've received from you, we can comfort others. Many times we've received blows and pains, even within the home, and through that we can minister to others who right now are hurting and know not of Jesus' comfort. You can give us the grace to turn the other cheek and to not add fuel to the fire. I'm reminded of the wisdom of Proverbs that says, without fuel, the fire goes out. Without wood, the fire goes out. 
And so many times, simply removing ourselves or removing the, the, the retort that's at the tip of our tongue will, will cool down what has become a hot room and maybe allow for peace to re-enter the home. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would, you would help us to be these people of grace, to take our problems to you, to be honest with you in what we bring to you, to, to, to have because we ask, that we wouldn't be shy to ask, and that we would also be humble to say, well, if it's not your plan for this to be removed or added to our life, may you give us the grace that's sufficient to press on for you. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to love you more than our, than our mother and brothers and father and sisters, and more than money, more than fame, more than acclaim, more than titles, more than anything, because you are Lord and you are God. And so would you enable us, you tell us in Scripture that we can do all things through Christ. And so we ask that Christ in us will enable us this week at work and at home to better shine for you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you would have a great week knowing that God your Father is with you every step of the way.